joining me and leading tonight's wonderful um, demonstration is artist Vaishali Prasmari. And Vaishali has been uh, exhibiting for just over 15 years. Uh, she has an MA from the Slade School of Fine Art and is working towards a PhD from Slade. Also in her work, she incorporates elements from a variety of cultures, including her own Chinese, Indian and Persian heritage into vivid and detailed pieces. And she recently launched an epic project on the 1001 Arabian Nights, part of her practice, her PhD at the Slade School of Art um, and a collaborative series called Carpet Pages. Um, Vaishali has very generously agreed and offered to run this demonstration to give you insight into, um, into miniature paintings. So I'm going to hand over to her in a minute, uh, just to let those of you who've just come in know that we'll be recording this um, to go on the website. So feel free to mute and um, turn off your camera if that's more comfortable for you. And I'll be fielding questions for Vaishali throughout the demonstration on the chat, so you can post them there. And on that note, I will hand over to Vaishali and uh, let her take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm going to change to this little diagram. This is just a temporary uh, diagram to just take you through what we'll be doing today. So. This is miniature painting. It's a slow art. That's the first thing to say. And there are essentially six main steps. So I've done already the first two, just to make it go faster, because it's so slow, which are, and this goes for all kind of traditional arts. Like you can quite generally generalize by saying that the traditional arts of which miniature painting is a part go through a preparation stage. So the preparatory, prepar preparatory stage usually involves getting your drawing, then and uh, tracing, tracing it, transferring it onto your surface, and then inking in the lines. So these two steps have already been done. And the way we do the transfer and trace is to usually use some kind of loose pigment, such as this. So I usually like to use an English red or Venetian red chalk or loose pigment. So on the back of the drawing or tracing, rub a bit of pigment, loose pigment on, on it, and then you transfer it onto your surface, which is this piece of paper. I'll talk a bit more about paper in a second. So you can transfer it using a variety of different tools. One of the, I've got a porcupine quill brush I specially made for this, and that just involves keeping the drawing intact and then making the lines. So I'll do little and that should transfer oops transfer over here and you can just see it's a little fuzzy that's because this pigment is loose and not bound yet by contrast if i do a pencil line this, that's what it looks like some people like to use pencil i like to use this pigment way because it's softer and more natural and it forces you to redraw the lines when you come to painting them so in terms of the sta these stages we are now here ready to ink in the lines and by the way, this is, this is something I came up with that's not official. I call it the house of miniature painting as a way to describe the technique. But this main house, this preparation layer, takes absolutely ages. It takes half the time of the entire process. The next stage, inking in and then color, color fill, we'll do together from now on. So inking in the lines involves tiny brushes. Get a, a small brush here. And usually, just under your hand, this is just a little tip in what I do, a spare bit of paper, just so you can rest your hand and not disturb everything. So the ink we use is, uh, you can use Chinese ink, or Sumi ink, Japanese ink, or Korean ink, any, any carbon-based ink, Persian ink, Arabic ink, Turkish ink, Indian ink, whatever, as long as it's carbon-based and indelible. The key is that it won't wash out by adding water in it, so this will work. And then you simply trace over, draw over the lines again. And you should see instantly it becomes quite sharp because I'm using ink now. Ink is a, is a fluid medium and the pigment, or rather lack of pigment, the, the colour has been bound already. 
and these lines are just for you the painter you will usually in most schools of miniature painting you'll obliterate these lines anyway by doing the color fill which is the next stage in terms of the paper this is watercolor paper 300 gsm hot pressed watercolor paper you can actually also get handmade paper especially for miniature painters um, from a place called Hussein Papers in India. They sell them at Khadi Papers as well. That's K-H-A-D-I, Khadi Papers. Let's do another area. Let's do, let's, let's do the little rabbit because that's going to be more fun to see. And then with the kind of shop bought paper, you need to do a process of preparing it for the miniature for these really fine lines to make it ultra smooth. So that involves, so this is the the original paper, bright white paper. What I've done is I've stained it. This is this is not to kind of fake antique it, but it, this is a process they really did in the past. They stained the paper, usually with tea or coffee or something like that. Also onion skin. This one is onion skin dye. Uh, or avocado, that's my new love of 2022 there is pomegranate turmeric saffron so many other kind of paper stains if you're into natural dyeing or, or natural fabrics or textiles then all those dyes pretty much can be used for paper and you don't usually need to add alum or things like that because you're not going to wear this or wash this this is it once you've stained the paper then you starch it or size it so you add starch and you make the starch from wheat or something like wheat could be wheat starch corn starch tapioca starch rice starch potato starch arrowroot starch anything that is kind of mucusy glutinous cucumber seeds some people not miniaturists but people who make kind of patterns or calligraphers like to use egg white it's called ahar paper and any questions okay yeah <laughs> that was rich but most miniatures, I think, like to use this plant-based starch because the animal ones, protein-based ones, are quite, uh, they're very strong. It's like if anyone's an oil painter putting rabbit skin glue before you paint or putting the gesso size protective layer before you start to paint. So it's the same thing here. We also do the same thing. Putting in the starch layer. So we've done the stain, then we starch it, and then we're ready to use it. Before we use it, though, before we do anything, we burnish it. So I would, let's see if I finish this area off now. So this was a brief demonstration of inking in the outline. So you'd have to do the entire thing, which is why I said that the preparation layer, which you've done now, takes ages and ages and ages. So that's the the kind of your foundation. Then one, two, three steps. Color fill is next. Then rendering an outline. Before we do in between each of these layers, there's a process called burnishing, which means polishing the paper. So we do some of that now. Let's see what we can... Yeah, we can burnish this one. Right, so this is another paint. Well, it's this way round, but I'm just going to do it this way round for now. So burnishing. Do it through a piece of paper. A piece of thin tracing paper or parchment paper, paper or baking paper. And you can use two well several different kinds of burnishers and the aim is to kind of rub the paper quite hard of course when everything is 100 percent dry you you do this so you see here i've just to explain i've inked in all the outlines here i've also started the color fill just because you know started but here i haven't done any so i was going to do that with you burnishing first in the ancient text, they say, use a stone egg, and this is exactly a stone egg. <laughs> a stone agate egg or marble egg. Rubbing, rubbing the colours down so that they feel at one with the paper on the same level as the entire page. So if this is your piece of paper and this is your colour on top that you've just painted, eventually it becomes like this, kind of at the same level as the paper. And the reason for that is, is, well, there are manifold reasons. One of them is that it protects the, the colour from being washed off. It also enhances the luminosity of the colour, because remember, in the past, they used many different uh, pigments, and the, everything was handmade. So one of the colours I love is malachite. And you may have heard of shell colour. So this is actually in a shell, but, you know, it doesn't have to be in a shell, but it, it, this one happens to be in a shell. Shell colours not made of shells but 
put in shelves for storage. And this is malachite. Uh, let's do let's do some colourful then. So I've done the burnishing. It's really smooth. You can actually hear it. Sometimes you can hear it. Sometimes the the burnished surface is softer sounding than the or silent compared to the non burnished rougher surface. So that's quite rough because that's a that's a natural pigment. So that's unburnished. That's burnished. So this is a handmade malachite. Malachite is a semi-precious gemstone, so the, another reason for burnishing is to make them shine, and polish them, so they're lustrous. And another reason is that it just because you're kind of batting them down to the level of the, of the paper, you're actually preserving them. It helps to it helps the longevity. And another reason is because these this is a book art, so the paintings went in books. And in order to be able to turn the pages and so everything wasn't so thick, they they made it kind of as one layer so you could turn the pages. So this is some malachite. I'll just paint that in somewhere. Maybe some of the leaves here. Okay. So in practice, you don't have to use handmade pigments such as this. You can also use shop bought watercolors. You may see it written when you see kind of the materials list of miniature painters, some people say gouache. I actually don't like that term gouache because gouache is a specific kind of different medium. Actually, it's, it's not technically watercolour because it has a lot of fillers added into it. And this is just the natural stuff. Watercolour, pan watercolour, is likely to be more pure. So it's what paint is essentially is pigment plus gum arabic plus water sometimes honey or, or things like that but generally the the sort of recipe is pigment which is malachite in this case plus gum arabic plus water if you had the malachite pigment added oil you'd have oil paint so the pigment is is very flexible add egg and you have you know egg tempera things like that there are a couple of different ways to do this color fill layer okay it's moving on so this one is the easiest. I'll do. I'll do it again. It is. Let's call it the the flooding method. So you just trace around. Around the outlines quite carefully now, and you see actually you can see the the lines are being obliterated slowly. And this is the point. So when you have your inking in the lines, of course you have to be careful doing it, but also knowing that the lines will be covered. And I get asked a lot. So why bother doing it? Then why not leaving it pencil? There is something about the muscle memory of doing it that makes it easier. There's a lot of repetition in miniature painting and a lot of yeah, patience involved. And it's part of the tradition as well. Just... So Shelley, you mentioned the question you get asked. Is this a good point to put to you a couple that popped up in the chat? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, Michelle asks, what did you use to copy your work? So tracing paper, sometimes self-drawn. Do you do you mean in terms of the original images or actually how to do it, the trace and transfer? I'm not sure. Rochelle, do you want to come in and ask or pop it in the chat and I can field it to Vaishali? Because this one, for example, this image originally is a it's very interesting one. This is a miniature painting copy of a miniature painting copy of Dutch print. <laughs> so I was very interested in, in the original Dutch print, which a miniature artist saw, and then I've obviously modified it and changed it, but, but I was interested in this figure, this melancholic man. And anyway, so what is it? was it that, or was it how to actually physically do it? I'm not sure. I've asked the person who asked the question to, uh, to clarify in the chat. Okay. Um, uh, I'll let you know if they do. Um, somebody else has asked, Marie has asked, could we have a material list? Um, if that's possible to provide that for uh, attendees, the materials that you've been using? Uh, sure. Actually, I have a materials. I, there's a forum for miniature painting online. I run it with, with a friend and it's called miniaturepaintingforum.com. And under, I think under resources, there is just a full materials list there. 
Okay, great. I'll, I'll find that link and pop it in the chat. Um, and Marie also says, thank you for your time and kindness, loving what you're doing. So I'll let you get on now and field any more questions, maybe in about another 10, 15 minutes. Okay, I mean, you can just do them as they come if you like. It's, it's okay. Up to you, Rachel. <laughs> Actually, I'll leave it to you. Um, yeah, still doing a little bit more of the colour fill. I'll show you just another way. And that is, this is a little more difficult maybe also to show, but it involves, there's a bead of colour in the, in the watercolour itself, the opaque watercolour, and we're using it in a very opaque way as well. And it's just to feel this colour, just kind of, there's no real nice way to explain it, but just to kind of make sure it blobs down in the right way. So you keep keep moving the bead of colour down the surface. And if you can see at the end, it will it will blob. This is quite a, an opaque color anyway. But those of you who are watercolorists will will know what I'm talking about the the bead of color, and then you just move the blob of water down, <laughs> the bead of water down. Um, but that but that's yeah again quite difficult. And then the other, but the, the just to kind of size up a little bit, there's another technique. This is called the full color. Stand that the majority of miniature paint paintings are painted like this, but there's another method which uses the watercolor not in an opaque way but in a very translucent way, in a diluted way, which is called nimrang or or mirang half color, and that just gives a very I mean, you see it a little bit here, but generally they don't mix it. Oh, let's do one example here, just as a half kind of light wash of color. And by the way, these, you can see the bead maybe more clearly here. I've had a question asking, are you copying the colour scheme as well as the drawing of this painting, or are you using your own combinations? Oh yeah, that is definitely my own. This is a very melancholic um, image, so no, this is completely my own combination. Com completely. Uh, what can I say about the colours? I mean, th this is a whole big rabbit hole. One of the rabbit holes is paper one of the rabbit holes is brushes so i went into the brushes rabbit hole because it seems kind of finite like there are only so many hairs you can, you can make a brush with so i make my own brushes I, I created a series of miniature painting brushes they're all on the this forum i'll send you the link the colors is a huge one there's so many pigments and so many colors uh, in the world so just as very very briefly malachite is just one of my favorites so just easy what else can i show you but there are so many, the blues and greens, I'll show you an example here. This, and, and there are so many colours within colours that if we say we finish this this, this colour fill for the demonstration, because the real work, and this was quite fast and what you saw, I managed to kind of just do that, that little part of the leaf fairly quickly. Then we move on to the rendering and the outline. These take ages to do. This is the this is the real painting. Everything here, in fact, even the color fill. This is the preparation. And and this is actually because you're just applying the color. You're not really painting it as you would imagine painting. You know, giving it form and yeah, just giving it form. There's no real shadows in miniature painting. That's one of the reasons why it is kind of permissible because they are not real figures or faces or human beings, or whatever. They they have no shadows. That's one thing I also get asked. So this is applying colors, not really painting, but these two, the rendering, which sometimes people translate as shading, but there is this difference, it's a subtle but important difference in meaning because you're not creating shading with shadows. You're just showing, revealing the form for what it actually is. That's the rendering, which takes a long time. So as you go up, it gets drier and slower. And then that final outline. So we'll do some rendering. And also just to show you that we use this egg to burnish, but you can also use different burnishes. You can use do I need to say, yeah, thank you, thank you. a cowrie shell. Cowrie shells are quite nice to burnish. You can also burnish directly onto the surface, but the first time you do it, just do it through a piece of kind of parchment paper, baking paper and then lift it off and then burnish directly so there's a lot of burnishing going on every layer obviously not in between every single stroke you do that would take ages but when it feels like it needs a bit of flattening then you 
you flatten it. So let's use some different colors here. Yeah, I was talking about color. So my my favorites are the kind of blues and greens, as is ever. That's why I showed this video. So malachite, azurite, lapis. Those are all traditional colors that they used. Lapis is this really lapis lazuli is really kind of deep blue. They often use it for the sky. Azurite is another nice blue as well. Azurite and malachite come from the same stone. There are other. I've had a question about pigments, but where you get your pigments from? All different places. If you're if you're based in London, again, there's a nice material of resources shops list in this forum. I'll put it on now actually, so that maybe I've put the link on there. I hope I found the right one. It looks yeah, like yeah. your website. Yeah, so, so yeah. Lot of the, yeah. Thanks, Rich. That's got a lot of the resources. But anyway, Cornelison. If you're based in London, Cornelisons. Otherwise, there's some American resources as well. So I don't quite know where you're from, but maybe I can help. And somebody else has asked, how long has this art form been in use? In you, that's a good, that's a good question, because in use is a nice way of phrasing it. Um, if you think we have extant manuscripts, it's a manuscript art, right? So how long have manuscripts been around in the Islamic world, Indian world? And that's a long time, ever since paper was was really introduced but even then before then they were still painting they also there are some rare examples of say painting on on vellum as well and papyrus of course but okay let's say from the uh, the 12th century was definitely they were in production kind of thing and they didn't only we we tend to focus on kind of elite royal beautiful manuscripts but they also had obviously m medical manuscripts mm, astrological treatises, even kind of notebooks that students would take. And they all had illustrations or paintings in them. So if you say 11th, 12th centuries to the 18th century, that's a long time. I, I always say 600 years about, and that's a kind of conservative estimate. It's probably longer. So a long time, re really long time. What killed miniature painting, the art of miniature painting essentially was the arrival of the printing press and photography. So the Mughals were in, in India were the last kind of bastion I suppose to, to hold out in a big way because they had the, the the patronage of the royals but also the family the family workshops of painters that stayed and you still have them today so in northern India Pahari painters of Pakistan that you and, and, and Iran and Turkey you, you'd have miniature painters but I guess not on the same scale I'm going to add some color so I'm going to add this pink into these rocks just to show you that rendering this is what rendering is it's a shading that's done with a lot of kind of tiny 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 brush strokes adjacent to each other and you can very subtly change the look of a of a piece the other thing is that opaque watercolor dries and changes color I don't know if you saw that color change it it dries differently it's not like oil paint what you see is what you get it kind of dries darker or lighter depending on the shade I don't know if you're able to kind of see that. I'll do something that's a bit more obvious. Having said all that as well, you're not necessarily aiming for something obvious with, with rendering. You want it to be a little subtle. And it almost looks like you're painting with nothing, but you are doing something. You just have to wait for it to dry. And then it will kind of magically appear. I'll, add some, I'll just dot this kind of around it. So this is carmine, originally carmine as a pigment, you were talking about pigments. Uh, this is crushed insects. Lovely. But I mean, this is not real carmine. Although you, no, no, yeah, cochineal, you can get real um, cochineal, but yeah. I, I generally like the mineral colours because of the burnishing. Some colours, just to say as well, are quite dangerous, so just be careful. The ones I mentioned, Malachi, Azra, Lapis, they're not the most dangerous, which is another reason I like to use them. But there are the reds and yellows and oranges, which are quite highly dangerous. So taking the yellows, Rialga Orpiment, this is arsenic. So you gamboge as well. You've just got to be careful. Cornelison's in London. Maybe I mentioned that already. They, they sell them. Then you have the... And you've got to be a bit careful as well about the sources of pigments because lots of people sell pigments uh, on Etsy and I, I obviously I can't verify all of them. There's a kind of legal issue as well, make sure 
you're getting them from legal sources, etc. A lot of pigments are the earth colors, the iron oxides, and you could, I suppose, in theory, get them yourself. I have friends who go to, I don't know, Hampstead Heath and just scrape bits of rocks and whatever. But just check if you're allowed to do that and stuff. Then the orange, so the orange color that I really like is a lead lead based color, lead red, it's this kind of scarlety red called Minium and that's actually what gave its name to miniature painting. It's not because it's small but I know you see how slowly it's going as well. I'll do some on another painting in a minute. It just happens to be small because it goes in books but actually it comes from the word miniature is not a, a word from the countries of origin, it's a western word that's been re-exported back and it's based on this Latin word Minium, lead red and that everybody uses miniature painting. It's actually manuscript painting, although they didn't have words, they just called it painting, it's just painting. So I've just added a kind of blush of this pink kind of across the top. And this is kind of natural because you're painting kind of with a, a wettish paint on top of something that's dried. So if you can imagine, those of you that do paint, if you paint something wet on top of something that's dried, for watercolors or even gouache you you can re-wet the layer underneath and it can all be a big mess and a big hole so in order to stop that you're just layering it on top with a dry brush this is dry brush technique called dry brush technique and it's about 90 percent dry so you're really just layering it softly over the top so let's do something else now so, so shelly two yep. things um uh, linda's asked crushed cochineal yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's and, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, crushed cochineal, exactly. And uh, Vicky said she loves the overall effect of the colour combinations. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but the thing is, it's this kind of sensibility, I suppose, that I suppose I have or have grown up with. And yeah, you find it just by looking at a lot of miniature paintings, I suppose. They really knew about colour and a lot of colour. I was now just going to use a, a bright orange that's very similar to to this Minium that I was, this is very similar to Minium. Sindur is called in in um, many Indian languages. If you buy pigments from India, Sindur. Very poisonous, but very nice. I just really like it. I'm just, it made me think of it, so I thought, oh, well, I'll do some here. So that's the orange, and then the yet the red the famous red which is similar to this one but this is not it because this red is really really toxic it's called vermilion chinese vermilion is the the real vermilion cornelis and sells it or you get french vermilion which is you may have seen or heard of french vermilion and just draw in the rocks quickly and then we start to render And this vermilion is made from cinnabar, so it's a, in the alchemical text they would say a marriage of mercury and sulfur, which is the chemical, the modern chemical formula for it is mercuric sulfide, and it's really, really dangerous. Can you see it's dried? And you see, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see it, Rachel? Just tiny, tiny bit of. Yeah, I can see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So it is really subtle. This is that's it. <laughs> that's all there is to say. It's just something that's really subtle, and you build up to this. So this one started with just blue. This is the blue div from the Shahnameh, which is uh, the the Persian Book of Kings. I love this text. Lots of divs and which are devils, little devils in it. Started off blue, just one flat color, and then on top of it, just been rendered. Hold on here. Let me do this one here. So you see it kind of come into being. So the word in Farsi is Pardacht, Pardaz, Pardaz in Urdu, I think. Also Perda, I think in, in um, Punjabi, <laughs> as I've taught uh, different students from different places, so they all tell me. It's, and this word is very significant. In, in these languages, it means to reveal or unveil. It's to do with veils or curtains or this kind of something that opens and closes and reveals the light. So you're revealing the form for what it is. Yeah, you, you can pretty much see that. And it's just several layers. So I've done 
one layer, you just call this one layer, and you kind of go in and do the second one, and you build it up slowly like that to get to something quite, uh, not dramatic, but kind of dark like that. You, you build up to it. You can also render in white on top of a color. Sometimes that's used, rarely, but occasionally. It's more difficult because that, that way you just have to cover it. You need more coverage. So very soon after this dries, we have to burnish it to flatten it down because now I've just added some layers on it and you want it to be a bit more subtle. So you would burnish. I'd wait for it to dry and then tamp it down. Let me sh see if there's any more. Oh yeah, there is something I really wanted to work on as well. So one thing we haven't talked about actually in terms of colour is gold. So I've done a bit of rendering there. Gold would have been done just before the colourful, after the inking in stage. So we are now on the little plan. We're still, we're still rendering. Yeah, we're, we're still here. But in, in between the inking in and colourful, there is, there is gold gilding. It just takes a long time, so I didn't show that. But there is that that option to gold gild. I'll show you this this guy here. This is a really exaggerated, blown up version of a mogul. I had a question about what precautions you usually take while working with toxic pigments. Okay, good question. Um, the toxic pigments are usually only toxic if you ingest them. So if they're bound in, you saw my shell, this is completely safe. As long as I don't eat it or lick the brush, and don't lick your brushes, don't eat it, that's the first thing to say. It's safe like that. However, if you're going to make your own, that's a different story because they are finely ground powders and I've made them you know, from crushing my own malachite stones and, and making, pulverizing them. And that's when it's dangerous, you have to wear a mask. And I've only really done it with stones that are not super dangerous, like malachite, azurite. Although it's, it's, it's not the actual inherent properties of it that make it dangerous, it's the fact that they are tiny, tiny, tiny particles that just get into your system. Um, so that's the problem with any colour. Obviously, if you're going to use something like cinnabar, which is the mercury sulphide, that's really... just be careful. I, ha I had a tutor once for a stained glass class I did and she had a, a toxicity blood test every year because she was just working with lead and you know and lead is in in paint in fact it's, again you can buy it in cornelisons but lead white colors that they would have used in the past they're just banned nowadays in most art shops and in fact in cornelisons they don't even sell it as a paint you have to make up the pigment yourself at your own risk so no point working with something like lead white when you have titanium white, which is just a, a really good alternative. It does the same thing. Well, not actually, it doesn't do the same thing. I've, I've used flake white, cremous white, lead white. It's, it's really nice, really thick and buttery. But for something like miniature painting, it's not oil painting. You don't need that thick texture. Titanium white is perfectly fine and safer, so just use that. So you can wear a mask. Actually, I did wear, you know, nowadays people are used to wearing masks. But there's a special kind of mask you wear. And you don't do it too often. When, when you when you make a, that amount of pigment, by the way, if, if you buy this in a shop, if you buy a kind of fingernails worth of malachite, it costs you about twenty pounds. So this is already quite a lot. So if I'm going to make a pigment, I'm, it's going to be something semi-precious. If you're going to, I mean, people love to do this as well. You know, making their own pigments from earth colors, so the iron oxides. But equally, from a shop, they are you're going to be the same, and it's going to be cheaper unless you have access to a spe specific kind of special earth. Thing. Um, just use your precautions, just be careful. I don't do too often. That's, I would say the main thing is I don't do too often. I don't need a blood test every year to check. You know. uh, wear a mask and do it in a well-ventilated area. And obviously wash your hands and everything. Um, and if you can, just steer clear of the really toxic pigments. If you don't have to have it, like white, you don't need to have white, then don't use it. That's another, that's a really good way of just kind of abstinence, don't use it. There are colours that are irreplaceable. For me, that's malachite and the, those colours. But some people say that, okay, cinnabar, this, this beautiful, rich red, is irreplaceable. So they, they use that, you know, but you just just be careful. By the way, what I'm doing now, this, in Turkish, I think it's called tarama. It's the same word as, no, it's not the same word, same meaning as paradox, which is the rendering. So it's still rendering. But it made me think of it because 
in Turkish the meaning is combing, like combing hair, and this is I'm painting hair, so it just happens to be. We've had a comment as well about lead, um, saying plus the lead white could eventually turn black yes. over time, so overall better to use a safer modern white pigment. Yes, yeah, because you do get some purists that only use, you know, they only use the traditional stuff, but then there's all these other things that the traditional artists would know that we don't necessarily know or have the knowledge has been lost. For example, exactly, even in oil painting, which colours to surround lead white with. That's why, that's why certain traditional paintings have a certain look, because they knew that, okay, this colour interacts with such and such colour, don't put it on top. Verdigris is another one that changes. It's beautiful turquoise. I love this colour, but it's just unstable. It's, it's fugitive. It's not going to last. In fact, that's why, going back to Malachite, it's like Malachite propaganda, <laughs> sorry, or Azure or anything like that. It's because they are mineral colours, and the mineral colours are the longest lasting. So colours can be divided into earth colours, which are the oldest. You see them in cave paintings, the oxides. They're very stable as well. Then you have um, your mineral colours, which I've talked about, could be th these ones that I've talked about. Then you have animal colours, which actually we've mentioned, this is carmine, or the famous Indian yellow, which is, you know, a bit of conjecture as well. The feeding cows on mango leaves to it's also a little bit animal cr cruelty so I don't don't want to kind of I'm not interested in, in um, finding the real source of Indian yellow as some people may be because I just I'd rather that cows were happy <laughs> and then you have the plant colors which are the most fugitive of all plant colors they're derived from plants and they exist they come into life as a liquid and then you have to do a kind of special process to make that liquid into a solid, i.e. to make it into a pigment, which you then make into paint. And they are fugitive, meaning that they they are they will fade. When you look at old tapestries or even old carpets or, or any old textiles, and maybe some of you are textile people, there's certain colours that fade and, and a lot of them are plant-based and the mineral ones are the ones that last. So the, in terms of the greens, because green is a very kind of and blue, they're famous kind of fading colours, so Malachite is a good one because it is more permanent. And then you have the what the so-called alchemical colours, which is the cinnabar, things that are they need human intervention to be made at all. So th these two minerals are put in an underground kind of crucible and exploded and things like that. So you see, I'm really, I started this painting in 2020, I think. Is it 2020? Something like that. I think 2020, or maybe very early 2021. And it's just carrying on because his face is done. This, this, this was done. But what is taking the long, long, long time is this hair, this uh, rendering. And you just have to let it dry in between each one. Otherwise, you will get holes and kind of carry on. So I take it out and work on it every so often. I mean, it is, it is quite black. It is quite done, but it could be, it could be more. It's always could be more. It's kind of hard to finish paintings as well. I'll just do a little bit more so it's obvious here. And then... It's just short or long dashes and dots, adjacent strokes next to each other. Just create subtlety. Yeah, so we only touched on gold briefly, just to say that it can be gold. They also use silver in terms of colours changing. They could... A lot of the water was silver. Gilt with silver, I'm not sure what the term is. I think it's just to silver something. It was silvered. And then that tarnished over time, so it becomes black. Which they knew, so it's kind of a mystery as to why they did it at all. Knowing it would tarnish over time. And we talked a bit about ink. I'll do a little bit more rendering here. And then I've got another type of ink to, to share with you. So this is, we talked about the Chinese ink, or equivalent. And just to kind of darken things. Just another layer. And so this process, this is for me the real painting, you know, rendering, making making it come alive, for want of a better word, and making it look like what it actually is. So making it into a ball rather than a circle, or making it into a burak, which this is, rather than a flat four-legged object with purple. 
body and, and human face. I don't know if people know what this Burak is, because there's a whole other kind of world of symbolism and and motifs in miniature painting, but yeah, it's a big old thing. Anyway, briefly, this is the Prophet Muhammad's night journey called the Isra or Miraj into the seven heavens, and he was riding this Burak, which is a kind of horse-like animal with a, uh, a human female head. And I've done this in black ink to make the hooves. And then, because there's one other ink, actually there's several inks, but for miniature painting purposes, just talk about this. What to avoid, actually, are uh, acrylic inks. So that one, and then we're going to do the same thing, but in walnut ink. Another one to avoid, actually, is oak gall ink. You may have heard, if you know about inks, oak gall inks, lovely stuff for other things, but there are certain inks that get darker over time. It's kind of legal inks. They, they, they last for 300 years or whatever. Used in manuscripts, but not for this. They're used for calligraphy. This, you, you're never, ever using the ink at kind of 100% strength. It's always a little bit diluted, a little bit paler. Because the, the, the really darkest ink is used for... The calligraphy. Actually, if you go and look at manuscripts, I don't know where you're all based, but if you go to the British Library or or the Met in New York, wherever you have access to manuscripts. Um, if anyone's in Europe, I really like the David Collection in Copenhagen. A really nice museum. There's a list of museums on the website as well, should be. I mean, that I've been to, not, not necessarily all of them. Walnut ink is brown. The moguls really liked walnut ink because it's softer. You can mix the walnut ink with the black ink. You can mix... So you see I'm dotting it around because I'm just starting it now. So I'm not going to do finish one hoof and then kind of move on. I will do all. I will work on all four of them at the same time and the sooner we move on to the final outlines as well. So walnut ink is softer. Moguls really, really like the use of walnut ink. They did a lot of faces. This is because the Emperor, Mughal Emperor Akbar, lifted the ban on the the depiction of human figures. This is a very famous Islamic thing. One is not supposed to depict the human form at all. Although what actually happened in practice is that they, they did anyway. <laughs> From the earliest, uh, you know, the earliest dynasties, the earliest Islamic kingdoms, the Umayyads onwards, they all depicted the human form, including of the Prophet Muhammad himself, uh, but that's another story. So you see, I've just done, I've just kind of touched on it a little bit. I did a bit of the tail as well. So I would say at least, I mean, this is probably my opinion, but the opinion of some scholars as well, the kind of hate, the height or the epitome of miniature painting was in the Safavid and Mughal times, this is the Indo-Persian miniatures people talk about, at least the two schools that I guess I'm most familiar with that I like, although there are others, I just don't know so much about them. There's Ottoman paintings, Arab miniature painting, there's a lot. There's the, the Chinese influence, Chinese painting influence on miniature painting is also quite famous. There was another Western transmission from um, Byzantium that's less lesser known, but it's still there from icon painting and things. So it's a big world. If you imagine geographically where these heartlands of miniature painting are, the Silk Road. You can imagine all the kind of cultural exchanges that went on between the two. Rembrandt made a copy of a miniature and it's thought that Leonardo da Vinci also saw miniature paintings and, and vice versa. So this Melancholia, the, the man that I showed you earlier on in this demonstration, he, this was a Persian artist who'd moved to the Mughal court and settled in India and made a copy of, uh, but made it his own, you know, made it in, in a Mughal style, added a tree. To, of a Dutch print that he's seen of the same theme, melancholia. They shared the same medical theories of the four humors, melancholia being, being one of the dry and cold, I think, hum medical humors. So they shared that. Don't forget that it was the Arabs who kind of kept the Greek knowledge alive, so medical knowledge as well. So there's a lot of crossover, but it's, it's nice to... Something I always like is, is cultural exchange anyway. So. so now we go in between. So if you think about it as little pixels or pigments in between the lines I've done previously just 
add it in here. And something I should also do is burnish in between because I've done a bit of painting now, so time to burnish. Again, through this, and I'll just show you another burnish there because when we get smaller and smaller and smaller, you want to, you don't have to use a massive burnish. You can use these tiny, tiny, well, small, small ones, smallish ones, and just burnish specific areas. One thing I have got, I have got on this painting is gold, which is just a good example of gold. So this fire here is gold. Often the holy figures or prophets or any holy figure, angels were printed, were pr painted with fire coming out of their heads. That's also a very Turkish tradition. I had, a, had an interesting question. Why are sometimes two miniatures from different manuscripts almost identical? They did copies of copies. I can't think of one actually in um, off the top of my head, but but something they also did was say they're painting. Have I got a similar? No. If they're painting a phoenix or similar facing one direction, this direction, because they have the tracing on tracing paper, they could then use that, and they had copies of kind of master books of tracings or master tracings. They could then use that tracing paper to turn it over around and, and trace it, this exact same thing on another page, and you find that you know recurring in motifs throughout the same manuscript because it's the same character essentially appearing several times. So you, you do see that. Do you have a specific example in mind at all or just in general? Another example, well actually I can think of one. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, Behzad. So the, the two, or I guess the most famous man, mostly there were men. There were some female miniature painters but generally there were men. Behzad. B E H Z A D or B I H Z A D. So Behzad was kind of the most famous miniature painter of all time, even in his time. Uh, my favorite is actually Sultan Muhammad, who came a bit after him. He he did kind of very colorful rocks, and this is used the colors I like. So Behzad was an innovator in many ways. He painted a a couple of camels fighting, which was then painted. You know, a copy was painted as a kind of homage to him by another artist. Um, Abdul Samad, I think, kind of in the future, as a way of kind of honouring him and also as an homage to him, and also as a, as a chance to show off his his own skills. So this idea of copying is really, it's a bit alien, I suppose, to modern modern Western culture, perhaps, but it wasn't alien at all then. It was seen in a different light, copying and tradition as a way of honouring what's come before you, and as a way of kind of continuity, I suppose. So the idea of tracing and transferring and this idea of there's no original but the original would be God or tradition or or, or not worrying so much about, about being original because knowing that there is none. The other thing you could do with ink, so we've used walnut ink, let's compare it quickly to the black ink. So they are different, one is softer than the other. But the other thing you can do is combine them. So you can combine them with each other, you can combine them with paint as well, so you could mix let's say a red into the ink and paint with that. So let's do that now because we haven't used red. So for me I use cadmium red. Cadmium is actually very poisonous as well, it's a heavy metal. But less poisonous than than cinnabar and and is a really nice bright red as well. So you can layer over the ink or actually mix directly into the ink themselves. You may not notice this uh, completely, you probably don't see it at all. But it is there to the naked eye. So miniatures, anyway, are kind of supposed to be appreciated singly, you know, by by one person or max two, you know, around a book encountered like that. <laughs> okay, and then let's go to the final outlines. So this is an image of water. We'll go back to the ink now. Some you can also oh I've got silver here as well so this it looks a bit grey but this is a silver yeah if you can see so that's a good example of silver nowadays if you're going to gild with silver mo most people don't gild with silver now because we know it tarnishes so they would use palladium or white gold or platinum or something like that which you can also get so the final outline sometimes you can even retransfer because if the colour fill is so thick you can just retransfer on the top. Maybe not all the lines, but just some guidelines to help you. So just really slow. So this is this is it now. This is the final outlines. Sometimes the lines. Well, there are two types of lines. Let's say. 
this is something they didn't take from China. China has a lot of different, Chinese painting has a lot of different line um, weights and, and types and thicknesses and styles, but in miniature painting they're essentially broadly only two because it's also about the colour, not the line, even though it's the art of the line, we say. There's the line that's absolutely uniform and straight, like that, so there's no variation. Then there's a line with kind of nuance, which kind of goes thick and thin, so you just add pressure onto the the brush as you kind of move it around. This is a natural form, so we just make it how we want. And then here, we do the lines. So. Thick and thin, just a little bit of taper. Uh, I'm just thinking, maybe I should show you some gold anyway, because I haven't shown you anything gold yet. I mean, in terms of how to use gold. So I've talked about gold gilding, which is you know done in the beginning. <coughs> oh, by the way, we're on here. No pencil, but we've done all the steps now, rendering, blah, 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 so we're on the final outline now, just to, so it's clear structurally in your mind. Let's use some gold as well. So, gilding has to be done before the colour fill, for various reasons. One, I guess, esoteric reason is that it's, gold is sacred, so you get it, you, you do that before anything else. Another practical reason is that it sticks to everything, so you just want to do that before there's any paint on it, otherwise it just sticks to everything here. Gold paint, real gold paint, is, is called shell gold, again not because it's made from shells, but because... Um, I'm just going to liquefy all this first. It's not made from shells, it's made from real gold that's been pulverized into a powder. That powder's then been mixed in, with gum arabic and water and then you have real gold paint. But it's called shell gold even in shops today. Or you can use gold, gold watercolour. Gold, this kind of gold, gold paint, can be used at any point in your painting journey. So so that's good, you don't have to kind of plan for it. You can use it. They, they often did if you're painting a figure. For example, you do the jewellery at the end. So you liquefy. I'm glad I showed you this actually because this, this is true for all pan watercolors. You kind of have to reliquify the whole surface, especially if you're using, you know, shop bought, I don't know, Windsor and Newton artist quality one. Always use artist quality because the student quality won't give you the same look. And then I use the tiniest brush. Now, do small bits here and the gold. So I call this one the clouds brush. For a minute, Jeff, might you just do? I wonder if you can see that. Oh, you can see that. Yeah, but it's just it will look quite dark. It's funny, and then on its side, it will kind of just. This is the problem. You can let me see if I can show. Yeah, this is the gold. If you can see. And this is the, 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 I guess, the point of, of a manuscript, and any medieval manuscript as well. Illumination by candlelight, you know, pre-electric ages. This is the beauty of them, is the gold, really, and the pigments that shine. And you only appreciate some things in, in, in real life. If you ever, I mean, this is a huge art form. I always like introducing it to, to new people. But it's a huge rabbit hole. You go to so many areas to. Uh, the gold is another rabbit hole. It's, it's a kind of medium in and of itself. It's such a beautiful thing. Even the tiniest strokes, they will just light up there. You can see them. Just want to see if there's a couple of other ones we can squeeze in. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so that was some outlining and gold. Then, this is quite a sad story actually. 
<laughs> this is, if anyone knows the story of Leila Majnun, this is him. This is the Romeo and Juliet, basically. It's like Romeo and Juliet, so he's quite sad. But I just wonder if there's any outlines I can do. Yeah, there is. So I'll do some outlining now, but in walnut ink. So again, it's not super, super dark. When you buy walnut ink, if you buy it commercially, sometimes it's, it's not super dark. Just be kind of like this, that's enough. That's enough darkness, and then just to outline very carefully. Let's do this one. I don't know if you can see, there's a difference on the left hand side as opposed to the right hand side. And outlines are not supposed, it's not stained glass, it's not supposed to be f seen immediately at first sight. It's not, make the outlines are not making an impact at all. They're supposed to be seen only at f on kind of second or third glance and you only really notice them when you look up closely. They're supposed to be quite subtle. And yet, most of the miniature is outlined. There are exceptions like in the rocks, you don't really outline every single kind of crevice because that would be difficult. But maybe you can see that now that there is an outline there. Some something is happening. Okay, do a little little figure as well. So these mogul artists, this is from a mogul painting, were influenced by I mean there's stuff going on there, but I just made it kind of fade into the distance. You see I at least I see I see Bruegel in it. I see influence of Dutch prints on it. He's so sad, weeping over his departed love but life goes on in distance people are still tilling the fields and arguing or whatever ideally you do it in one stroke like I'm doing but if, if not it's not a problem as well as long as you're kind of keeping to the one it, as long as it looks like in the end one line so it's never ever kind of sketchy lines like this it's one decisive line that would make a an outline that's what makes a miniature so I guess the two main things are the fact that it's outlined and the burnishing so just a little bit there and then just one last one which is this one it's kind of nice to end on him actually he is the prophet Mani you may have heard of Manichaeism but he's the other myth mythical kind of figure that was supposed to be one of the best painters in Islamic culture, Mani is still lauded as this mythical, you know, legendary, really good painter because he preached his philosophy through painting. So I'll just outline the pair of little pair of scissors. And there's a famous legend him depicting a dead dog to warn people not to drink the water from this certain lake or whatever. And so I'm, I didn't want to paint a dead dog, so I just made my dog alive. And these are the accoutrements of a miniature painter. So the portfolio, the actually I don't know why the scissors are there, but they're always good. And then the brushes here. This is the brush pot, and then the water pot. Yeah. Okay. Any questions. That's about the red of cinnabar, I believe. But it's cadmium. Uh, any questions? Yeah, there's no more questions come through on the chat. So the more it is. Oh, nice to see your face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I, that was so, so beautiful. I don't know about everybody else watching, but I found that so meditative just watching the strokes, um, watching you paint really slowly. I can see what you said about it being slow painting, but you take your time with it and you're really, really thinking about the placement. So it was absolutely fascinating. Um, lots of lovely comments coming through, but we haven't got any more questions unless anybody wants to, to step in uh, and uh, unmute themselves, please do. That was quite a whiz through miniature painting, so I think I was quite...
comprehensive, maybe quite overwhelming because I just went through a lot of different paintings and showed kind of all the processes. Um, so normally when I teach, it's just very, very slow. But for a demonstration, it might be a bit boring if I worked on the same painting throughout. So I just thought I'd skip. Well, we've had lots and lots of appreciation here, um, but no, no further questions. Uh, so I think we'll we'll wrap up there. I want to say thank you again to Vaishali for such a somebody said soothing, <laughs> which it was, and peaceful, um, and inspiring as well. And um, to say that if you're interested in Vaishali's work, which is as stunning on the big format as it is, you've seen close up here, her work can be seen in the exhibition, which is um, on show until this Saturday. So you have like less than one more week to see it in the P21 gallery uh, in uh, near King's Cross in London. If you're in or near London, please, please do visit. We also have two more events coming up tomorrow night on Wednesday night. We've got another um, uh, workshop, which is with uh, two other artists, which is about digital and illustration. And then on Wednesday evening, we have a really what's going to be a really fascinating uh, talk, the final in our artist talks um, with a selection of artists who are going to be thinking about art practice in conflict and in challenging environments. And all of that information is on our website, which I popped in the chat. Um, so please do please do stop along, sign up for their talks. And thank you again to Vaishali. That was a really, really great demonstration. I feel inspired. I have no artist that's done at all, but. <laughs> um, and thank you everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you.